Okay, so um, by a show of hands here, how many people want to be healthy and happy? Awesome! Now you know that everybody here has something in common to talk about. Now, another show of hands, how many people in here have a birthday? Awesome! So, let me ask you for a favor. If it's, if it's not your birthday today, May 11th, I want you to shut the ringer off on your phone. That way we know if your phone rings, we're all going to sing happy birthday to you. <laughs> So you may be wondering, um, why a dinner, why a chiropractor, what's this all about? I mean, by a show of hands, honestly, how many of your internists have taken you out to dinner to spend an evening to educate you and like that? <laughs> so the truth is, this almost never happened. When I say this, I mean upper cervical chiropractic of mom, the 11 years of service and all of those people. Because I grew up here in Alabama. And much to my parents' dismay, I actually played football. And back in the 90s, when I played football, we were actually taught to hit with our heads. Whoever had more scuffs on their helmet was a tough guy. And so my neck was never right after that. I thought it was normal to turn your neck and hear creaking and have pain. And I got through University of Maryland, and I knew I wanted to uh, help people and work in healthcare. And I was attracted to chiropractic. I was attracted to chiropractic because it doesn't put anything into the body and it doesn't take anything out of the body. Give it to me. Uh, and so there I am in chiropractic school. I'm hearing about the miracles of chiropractic and I'm falling in love with the philosophy and science of chiropractic. And I'm getting adjusted by one of my professors with a traditional chiropractic technique which helps millions of people every day. But for me, it wasn't working. And I was questioning my decision to become a chiropractor. And I remember calling home and having these conversations like maybe I made the wrong choice, I was questioning it, maybe I should transfer now before I get too deep in. And I'll never forget, I was in the C building and I came out of my public health class and I'm telling this story to a young lady in the hallway. She said, before you do anything rash, go listen to this upper cervical doctor speak on campus. He's coming on a Wednesday night. This is why I do this on Wednesday nights. <laughs> so I went, and he didn't speak. Our mentor, Dr. Friedman, he brought six patients who told these unbelievable, miraculous stories. And as amazing as their stories were, I was even more amazed that they took the time out of their life to come to the campus to talk to the students. But like all of you, I'm from New Jersey, and you gotta prove it to me, right? So I go in as a patient, and for me, I was attracted to the science of the exam, the digital x-rays, and the adjustment was so light, so gentle, I barely even felt it. And for me, I knew instantly that this was different and I was in the right place. Uh, for me, everything felt right again in my body. I begged him to allow me to shadow him. I said, I need to take out the garbage. And he agreed, and I spent every Tuesday in his office, and he received patients from all over the world. And to this day, he's still my mentor, and now I sit on the board of the technique. And I tell you that story, because what if that young lady, who to this day, I don't even know who it was, didn't say, why don't you go listen to this doctor speak on campus on a Wednesday night? So I do believe in angels, and I believe she was an angel that came into my life. And our founder, our developer of chiropractic, BJ Palmer, said, you never know how far something you say or do will affect the lives of millions tomorrow. And she doesn't know how many thousands of people we've touched and will touch. But for those of you who are practice members here, you are that angel. Because you cared enough to leave your busy, hectic life and to, for some of you, beg somebody, tie them up, throw them in your trunk, and bring them here tonight so that they can learn something that you know. I've got to tell you, I've never seen a television ad or commercial promoting upper cervical care. It just doesn't exist. We're all here because somebody shared it with you. So why do we do a dinner? That's why we do a dinner. Most of the practice members who we embraced tonight said, hey, it was this dinner that I found out about you. All of us were told by someone who cared enough to tell us. So thank you, practice members, for sharing. So, I'm just gonna grab, um, Doc, you want to grab me that water right there? Yes. So, 
nine years ago, there was a very special event in this room where a mother named Pat stood right there where Lisa is, and the room was full of about 120 people, and there wasn't a dry eye in the room. Everybody had a tear in, her, in their eye. Because Pat was telling the story of her daughter Stephanie's recovery under upper cervical care. I'm going to give you guys a lot of stories tonight because I just think it's more fun to listen to than information. But we'll give you some of that too. And so uh, Stephanie was a high school gymnast. She was a sophomore or junior at the time. She was out to the movies at, by the Freeland Mall there. And she went paralyzed just sitting there in the movie theater. She couldn't move. So they drove her up to Robert Wood Johnson by ambulance. They start running the battery of tests, and they came back with a diagnosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome, which for those of you who don't know, is a progressive neurological disease that can eventually lead to paralysis and even respiratory failure and death. The, the, the diagnosis even to this day, and I saw Stephanie uh, uh, last week, it was still questionable because she got the movement back in her body, but she was left with such chronic pain and fatigue and muscle spasm that she had to be homeschooled, she was out of gymnastics, she had no social life at 16 years old. This went on for a year as the parents took her down to Chop in Philly, up to um, the biggest and best on Park Avenue, infectious disease doctors, neurologists, orthopedists. Finally, the doctor said, you got to take her to a child psychiatrist, we think it's in her head. So after a year of a miserable existence, they contacted my office. Now I'm a newer practitioner and, uh, at the time, and this one girl changed my whole life. And I've told her this and I've embraced her and shared this with her. Because even though I've heard about the upper cervical mir miracles and I had great results and I've read the research, this was the first miracle that I've witnessed in my office. And for those of you who know me or will get to know me, I take no credit for any of the results that happen in the office. I am just a wrench between him and you. Nairi says I'm Mr. Goodrich. <laughs> <laughs> but even if the doctor, this most skilled surgeon in the world, fixes a fracture, right? What heal? What, eventually, the bone has to still heal. So we can facilitate the healing process, but we can't heal the body. But you heal you. So we started adjusting Stephanie, taking some pressure off the top of her spinal cord, very gently, the same way that happened for me. And I gotta tell you something about healing. It's not like you hit a switch and the person's healed. It's not like on television, you know? There's a healing is a process. Everything is a process. A, a, a butterfly, a caterpillar to a butterfly, there's a time component. A baby being born, there's a time component. Even your lawn when it turns yellow, there's a time component to healing. And so we watch Stephanie's life come back on. She started to get enough energy and the muscle spasm started to reduce so that she could go back to school. Then I remember she used to go back to her social plans. Then she went into the gym to watch. Then she started to tumble. And I'll never forget the day she came to the office and she said, Dr. Larry, I did giants. Anybody know what giants are? That's when they go. And so now fast forward, it's probably nine or ten years later, Stephanie graduated from Seton Hall with a master's in speech therapy. She's engaged to get married this October, and she drives down from Jersey City every two weeks to maintain her health. So I do believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that we do save lives with the chiropractic adjustment. Because where does that young lady end up if by a miracle her mom doesn't contact us that day? Does she go back to school? Does she become a speech therapist? Does she get engaged? Does she have babies one day? And I can tell you a story after story after story after story. And you say, well, how can a chiropractor save a life? It's not like if there's an accident on the, God forbid, on Main Street, and somebody's arm is dismembered, and they're spouting out blood, and you're going to bring them here, and I'm going to adjust them, and their arm's going to sew back on. 48,000. 48,000 white women have died in our country in the last 11 years because of prescri pro properly prescribed prescription painkillers. That's Vietnam War numbers. And I used, when I used to bring up that statistic, it, I used to say, why isn't anybody having the conversation? The conversation is being had right now on CNN, 8 o'clock, Anderson Cooper, Sanjay Gupta, prescription addiction. It is the leading cause of accidental death in our country. 
his prescription overdose. Now, we have hundreds of patients, hundreds of patients in our practice, and I can only think of two people right now who are taking those medications. And that 48,000 number from the CDC was only white women. That doesn't include the men or the women of other ethnicities. That number is over 100,000. Now again, five people get Ebola, and it's a national headline, and everybody wants to change everything. But this is buried in the back of the newspaper as people are suffering. And when the doctor finally gets fed up writing the script, and it's $40 to buy a Percocet or a Nazi cotton on the street, what does the person turn to? Heroin. We save lives in our office because I think about those white women in that study, if they were in an office like ours, getting the care like ours, do they get off of their narcotics? Like we've seen so many of our patients do, I never take anybody off of drugs because I'm not a medical doctor. But they, your doctors, are glad to take them off of that. We'll promise you. Or maybe they learn some new information and they don't um, choose to take it. Or maybe because our patients are getting care, they, we've changed the trajectory that they were on. And so 80% of heroin users started out with prescription pills. It's a major problem. So we have a system of helping people regain their health without putting anything in or taking anything out. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. So every day I go to work, I think about how many more Stephanies are in this world, in our community. And we fight tirelessly to get this message of health and healing and hope out. And it should not be a secret. In fact, every week we have a staff meeting and part of our meeting is our magic moments. Because as they are so busy at the front desk and then they don't hear the stories. And we hear story week in and week out. And so we have some practice members here today that are going to share their stories so you can see the principle in action. So we're going to have a conversation about health. And what I've learned through the years is that everybody has their own definition of health. So if we're going to talk about health, we've got, we got to get on the same page. Here's the card hold facts. A third of Americans are living with a chronic disease right now. We consume 234 billion of the 300 billion dollars the world spends on pharmaceuticals in this country. Our gross domestic product is 15%, meaning every time you pay your Verizon bill, go to Starbucks, watch a movie, or go out to dinner, 15 cents on the dollar is going to pay for the sick care of the employees of that company. GM spends more in healthcare than steel, and Starbucks spends more in healthcare than coffee. I contend that we don't need more drugs and surgery, that we need more people less sick. When a third of Americans are either diabetic or pre-diabetic, including children, and it will cost an extra $250,000 in medical costs to sustain that person, and that person will probably live statistically eight years less. We got a problem that we can't spend ourselves out of. We need a new way. And so we need different information. So what are you saying, Dr. Larry? Like, like medical, we don't need medical doctors? No, don't mishear me. Medicine and medical doctors play a critical role in our culture. In fact, if there was a crisis, there's no other country that I'd want to be in in this country. Medical doctors have saved family members of mind lives. They shine there. It's just the day-to-day -day stuff. They can't keep you, they can't, they can make you not sick, they can't make you healthy. They can make you not sick anymore. They can't make you healthy. Who, whose responsibility is to make you healthy? No, I know it's your insurance company, right? No, 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 I know, I know. It's the federal government. They're gonna do it for you. No, it's your doctor. Your doctor's responsibility. No, it's your responsibility to create health in your life. So I look at it this way. If your house is on fire, who do you call? You've been here before, Peter. <laughs> you always plant Peter in front. <laughs> the fire department, and hopefully if they get there in time with their axes and their hoses, their drugs and their surgery, they bash through your front door, they break through the wall, they hose down all of your belongings, your TV, your couch, your computer, your Mac, and if they got there in time with their axes and hoses and they save your house, who do you call the next day? Do you call the fire department back and say, can I have some more axes and hoses, please? But that's what people do. 
And so you call the contractor to come and rebuild the house. And so here we are, the general contractor, and we don't have axes and hoses. We have nail guns, paintbrushes, ladders, and the fire department goes, well, that's ridiculous. You can't put out a fire with a nail gun and a paintbrush. And we go, we're not trying to put out fires with nail guns and paintbrushes. These houses are spontaneously combusting. We want to get into the house before it catches fire. Check the foundation, check the electrical wiring, check the roof. Teach the homeowner how to avoid a fire in their house. So do we need a fire department? Yes. Do we need contractors? Yes. What we need to learn is when do you call the fire department and when do you call the contractor? And that's what we're here to teach. There's a time and a place for everything. So, what is health? How do you know for health? You're not sick. You're not sick. Well, let me ask you a question. Would you rather be pretty or just not ugly? Smart? We're just not dumb. Rich, we're just not poor. Would you rather be healthy or just not sick? So there's a continuum. Illness is here, wellness is there. Not sick right in the middle. I call false wellness. This is where you're cozy and you're doing pretty good. The thing that's obvious is if you're alive, you're on this continuum. The thing that's less obvious is that each and every day you're either moving towards illness or towards wellness. Nothing alive is staying still. And so we have to have behavior, beliefs, behaviors, action steps, strategy to move us this way or we go this way. Typically when I ask that question, I'll hear not sick or if I feel good. If I feel good, I'm healthy. I'm here to tell you, you know, I want everybody to feel good in here. I want to feel good. I want my family to feel good. How you feel has nothing to do with your health. Cancer, heart disease, strokes, diabetes, hypertension, AIDS, osteoporosis. These are some of the worst conditions human beings have. And oftentimes they feel good until they feel bad or get a test. And we all know somebody who, who felt good one day and then wasn't here the next. So just relying on your symptomatic picture to determine your health level may be, not maybe, is an incomplete strategy. According to Dorland's Medical Dictionary, their definition of health is a complete state of mental, physical, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease and or infirmity. So by a show of hands, how many people here have a complete state of mental, physical, and social well-being? <laughs> Nobody ever raised their hand. See, here's the definition of health. It's sort of a utopic definition. It's kind of like education. We all have a level of education that hopefully is greater than most people on this planet. But could we all be more educated than we currently are? Does it just happen automatically, or do you have to work at it? You have to work at it. Same thing with health. Do you all, do we all have a level of health that's greater than the people in Central State right now? Absolutely. Could, do we all in here have different levels of health? Absolutely. Could we all have better levels of health? Absolutely. So health is a process, not an event. But I've got news for you. Illness is a process and not an event. And so I do believe, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that in our office, we are experts in healing. We've seen hundreds of people heal. We've healed nobody, but we've been the one present when it's happened. Healing is a universal law. What's a universal law? It's a law that's true whether you believe it or not, wherever you are on this planet, like gravity. Whether you're in New Jersey or New Zealand, if you jump off the roof, whether you believe in gravity or not, you're falling. Healing is a universal law. God and nature, whatever you believe in, gave us a healing capacity. Otherwise, guess what? None of us would be here. Human beings have been on this planet for tens of thousands of years before medical doctors and chiropractors were invented. Okay? There's a survival and a healing mechanism in the body. Well, Dr. Larry, if it's a universal law and everybody's supposed to be healing, why are so many people sick and suffering? Why aren't the peace falling? Why isn't that plane falling out of the sky? Could you interfere with the law? Absolutely. So what I've witnessed is healing is always an inside-out pra pra process, never an outside-in process. It's kind of like being in a hot air balloon. To go up, you've got to dump, remove weight. Same thing with your body's healing mechanism. Most people, when the stuff hits the fan, are quick to look out the window. When things are going all right, we look in the mirror, right? 
So we're looking for an outside in answer everywhere in our culture. There's a time and a place. Sometimes people need an outside in approach to get not sick, but it will never make you healthy. So if I ask the room, how many people here are healthier today than they were five years ago? Just by a show of hands. Awesome, awesome. Now if I went around the room, and I'm not gonna do that because it's dinner time. I typically will hear that the person has made some kind of lifestyle shift or change in their life. Like, maybe they changed their diet, maybe they lost weight, maybe they started to exercise, maybe they quit that job, maybe they divorced that person. Maybe they quit smoking. Maybe they eliminated the stress. Maybe they got back on a budget. They've made changes to their way that they live and that's where health comes from. How many people believe that it's possible, possible, to be healthier five years from now than you are today when you're at our dinner? Awesome. That's an important belief to have because if you believe that as I get older, I get sicker and sicker and need more and more intervention and it just must be old age, that is a very dangerous belief system to have. You might as well just write your ticket. You have control to make a change. I ain't saying it's easy, but you can do it. But you can do it. So, healing is an inside-out process. The only thing that stops people from healing is interference. We need to find out what's interfering with the process, remove the interference, and then the body heals. Every time. Every time. So I'm going to teach you chiropractic in four sentences. Your body is self-healing and self-regulating. Who has ever cut their finger? Well, I don't see any cuts on your fingers anymore. What made new skin? Uh, the mandate, right? No, no, that neosporin, like in the commercial, right? No, your body made new skin. If you break a bone, what makes new bone? Your body makes new bone. Your body is self-healing and self-regulating. Right now, your heart is beating, your lungs are breathing, your stomach is stomaching, and you're not even thinking about it. If, could you imagine if you had to tell your heart to beat? Joe and I would have to hire somebody to do that for us. Right? <laughs> your body is self-healing and self-regulating. What system in the body is responsible for the healing and regulation of the body? Central nervous system. Awesome! Peter, Peter, I'm not giving you a star again. <laughs> I love this guy. The central nervous system. I never hear cardiovascular system. I never hear digestive system. I never hear integumentary system. That's your skin, by the way. It's the central nervous system. Your brain and your spinal cord are controlling every organ, cell, and tissue all the time. Not some all the time, not all some of the time, all, all the time. Your nervous system is everywhere. If I were to strip away Peter's skin, muscles, tendons, and ligaments, we'd still see him sitting here because the nerves would be outlining his body. And if you don't believe me, just take your fork and start poking it around. Anywhere you feel your fork, there's a nerve. And all those nerves filter up through the spine up into the head. And then the head, the brain, filters down. And it's a constant messaging system. In fact, there are 11 trillion bits of information per second going from your brain to your body and your body to your brain. So if you were to interfere with your nervous system, would you be healthy or sicker? Sicker. Chiropractors remove nerve interference, period. What about back pain? Nope. Sciatica? Nope. Headaches? Nope. Vertigo? Nope. Fibromyalgia? Nope. But Dr. Larry, I saw your website. All these people came to those things and got better. People come as a result of their symptoms. They get better because we've removed interference to the nervous system in the top of the neck, this critical area where the brain meets the spinal cord. No more critical area to your life than your upper neck. So let's say I buy this, Dr. Larry. Uh, get nerve interference, and that's why I'm sick, and this is why I'm suffering, and this is why I'm sick and tired, because I'm sick and tired. What is that nerve interference that you're talking about? In chiropractic, we call it subluxation. You call it stress. Physical, chemical, emotional stress. I think about the fact that chiropractic came around 120 years ago, right before the Industrial Revolution, when a human being's life was drastically about to change. It came around at the perfect time. None of you have physical stress, right? Because you all work out five to six days a week, have a trainer in your involved, a Pilates reformer in your living room, have perfect ergonomic core stations, change your mattress every uh, three months. <laughs> right. None of you have emotional stress. Are you married? Do you have kids? Finances and the Channel 11 news, okay? Um, and none of you have chemical stress because we all live in New Jersey. 
and clean the, breathe the clean New Jersey air, drink the clean New Jersey water, and we're never exposed to any chemicals, insecticides, or pesticides. Let's face it, Dr. Larry, stress is part of life, it ain't going anywhere. We can mitigate it, but your bodies all have a threshold of to how much stress you can handle. This is why people get sick around the holidays, because it goes up. And when stress crosses your threshold, things go south. Your body has lost the ability to adapt to that stress, just like if the thermostat broke in here, the room would start to get kind of hot and steamy because the room lost its ability to adapt. Raise your threshold, raise your, to adapt, raise your health. Your nervous system was given to you to help you sense the environment and adapt and push back against stress. If I take a 100 pound barbell and pump it out 12 times, my body's gonna respond to that stress by making more muscle. I put that same 100 pound barbell on my 94 year old grandma and it ain't gonna be good. It's the same stress, but I have a better ability to adapt. Upper cervical chiropractic is the safest, gentlest, and most effective way to help your body better adapt to lifestyle stress, period. And you know who needs it the most? The children. The children. I don't have the time to talk about it, the children. Probably about 20% of our practice is pediatric. No, why don't we just wait till they have disc herniations, pain going down their arm, and then we'll find them a chiropractor. Why don't we just wait until they have need four root canals, and then we'll find them a dentist. That makes sense. Yeah. So we want their spine and nervous system growing and developing optimally, so they suffer less, too. Do you know one in five children have a mental health diagnosis? One in 28 boys in New Jersey are autistic. One in 10 children are being treated for asthma. $50 billion a year to maintain it, we spend as a country. One, 20% of high school boys are on Ritalin, which is, uh, or Adderall, or ADD, which is methamphetamine, which has been linked to addiction later in life. Drug-free school zone. Really? Really? Which drugs? Okay? So, you know, look, and Ayn Rand, who wrote The Fountainhead and Apple Shrug, said, wherever there's contradiction in society, there'll be destruction. So, I want to show you this principle in action, because right now it sounds like a pretty cool and simple theory. It's a simple theory, but it's not simple to pull off. And so we have two practice members here tonight that are gracious enough to share their stories of health and healing in our office. They're not professional speakers. They are people who are sharing the most personal health information with you to try to make a difference in your life and your family's life. Please envelop them with love. They're members of our community. And uh, the first person that I want to bring up, her name is Nigel. Come on up, Nigel. Amazing. 
I went home and kept going for a couple of months, um, from September of 2014 to about April of 2015, because I started feeling better, and I figured it's a lot of money, or, uh, you know, okay, so let's take a, take a little break and see what happens, and three months later, I was begging, crying to come back. So, uh, don't give up, keep going, <laughs> and it does help. I ended up um, calling them back, and Stacy even helped me uh, get into the office. I literally, one day, could not get out of my bed. My mom and parents had to come and help me up. I couldn't walk but like a, a centimeter at a time without taking a break, and it was just stuck, just stuck, excruciating, tears dripping down my face, pain. I wouldn't wish it upon anyone. Um, so I walked in and didn't give me any grief, didn't say I told you so, just said, okay, come on, get you stretched out, get me adjusted, got back in the car slowly, however, a little bit better. By the time we got home, I got out of the car myself. I was able to walk back into the house. My parents' jaws were on the floor. They were in shock that within that short amount of time, between that adjustment and the stretching and everything we did, I was able to go into the house myself without walking, pulling my leg an inch at a time. So that was a miracle right there. Um, so all I can say is don't give up on yourself. You have one life, one body. Be good to it. These guys are here to help you. They're amazing. Um, you can do it. Don't, don't give up on yourself. Like, you want to stop going, you're feeling good, don't stop. Really don't. And it's worth it. I, I can't speak highly enough. I could, if I could tell everyone to come, if I had a zillion dollars, I would tell everyone to go. I'd pay for everybody. Um, <laughs> but it, it's really an amazing place, and uh, my life will always be different because of them. So, thank you. another part of the body. So underneath the umbrella of chiropractic, there's lots of different techniques and approaches. I don't have my own. Yeah. So it's kind of like, like law, right? There's lots of different types of attorneys. You've got the bankruptcy attorney and the, and the uh, divorce attorney and the business attorney and tax attorneys. So I think chiropractic has lots of different approaches too. And there's 80,000 chiropractors in the world, and they're somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 upper cervical doctors. So we're subspecialty in the profession. It's training above and beyond what we get exposed to in the chiropractic curriculum. And the reason we chose to focus on the upper cervical spine is because of those 11 trillion bits of information per second that are coming from your brain to your body, guess where they all got to pass through? Your upper neck. So your dad was right. You actually do have a hole in your head. <laughs> and out of your brain comes your brain stem, and every single vital function from your blood pressure to your libido, to your digestive system, to your hormonal regulation is controlled at the level of the brain stem. It's, your most, it's the most primitive brain, part of the brain. There's a little bone that sits underneath your skull called the atlas. Named after the Greek god that held up the world, this little bone holds up your world. What makes this vertebrae very unique is that it weighs 10 to 12 ounces, and it's the only vertebrae in your spine that's not locked in with a disc above or below it. There's no disc. And it doesn't have these funny interlocking joints that stacking up chairs. It's literally floating in place, held in place by soft tissue, muscles, tendons, ligaments. And that's what allows it, your neck to spin 160 degrees because it spins on the, uh, on the axis. 
Over the course of your life, you're exposed to different accidents, injuries, and traumas. The first one being birth, right? And then you're, learn, you're, you're um, starting to sit up, and I got a little boy, and we've seen him go conk, conk, fall off the ottoman, conk. And at 18 months, he can point to the adjusting tool and say, <laughs> no, I'm just going to wait until he's symptomatic to check him. Okay. Um, then there's the sports injuries, the concussions, the car accidents, sitting at, sitting at work, texting, technology. All of this is stress to the spine. And what happens is if you get hit from the right, your body goes left. If you get hit from the left, your body goes right. If you get hit this way, there's nowhere to go. So what happens is at some point in your life, you have accident or injury, or multiple accidents or injuries, and your body starts to go off center. You don't feel this yet. It's called a misalignment. It's asymptomatic, like so many, like plaquing in the arteries that you don't feel, or blood pressure that you don't feel. And you will live life like this, and it leads to abnormal movement patterns, progressive wear and tear. Eventually, not years, but decades later, a symptom shows up. So you call the doctor, you call the bone doctor, you call the orthopedic, and he takes an x-ray or an MRI, and they find that the right knee is worn down, or the left hip is worn down, or your C5 is herniated, your L5 is herniated, and they look at you and they go, it's part of the normal aging process. And I ask, how old is the other knee? <laughs> <laughs> it's silly, but this is exactly what happens. It's pure mechanics. Whatever joints you're being asked to do more for years or decades are naturally going to wear down. Do you replace all four tires at the same time, or does one usually blow up first? And so I'm in an analysis issue. And so then the disc collapses, then the nerve gets pinched, then the migraine starts, then the arm pain starts, then the pain goes down the leg, then the fibromyalgia starts, and what happens, we get to treat the symptom or the nerve or the disc, when what we need to do is treat the trauma, the collapse of the spine. And so what bone's out of place here? They're all out of place. Your neck and your back are two different body parts. It's an organ. It would be like going to the cardiologist and only looking at the right side of your heart. This affects this, and this affects this. It works together. So we're the only system in chiropractic, and I know many of them, and trained chiropractors all over the country, that looks at the spine not as a bunch of dominoes that got out of place, but a system that collapses over time into the force of gravity. Like taking a Pepsi can. You take a Pepsi can, you push it down, it doesn't collapse. It's got complete integrity. You twist it a drop. It loses all of its structural integrity, and the whole thing collapses. And that's what we see when we look at x-rays. We see curves, we see scoliosis, we see bows. So you collapse this way, the body compresses, and then you start doing this. And we've seen it with our moms and our grandmoms, right? Everybody's worried about gluten and Zika virus. What you need to be worried about is gravity. Gravity? Gravity. So Scott Kelly, the astronaut just went to outer space for a year with the International Space Station. He came back and he was two inches taller. Do you guys hear this? Within two days back on Earth, he was back to his resting height. Because gravity is compressing. And I've always joked with patients after I adjust them, I'm going to send you to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> or we'll check you again when you need to be checked. So when this collapses, it doesn't just affect your back, it affects your heart, it affects your stomach, it can cause GERD. It compresses your liver. It compresses your spleen. Your body compresses. Many of you know that you're one or two or three inches shorter than you were. When's the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. If you didn't plant it, when's the best time? Now. Now. For some people, it's too late. We have a patient, we, he came in, it's too late. I had to send him to the neurosurgeon. He already has changes in his spinal cord. So my own mom, Last Thanksgiving, right before Thanksgiving, shows up at the office like this. Mom. And it doesn't matter how many people you help. When your mom shows up, you go, please God, give me this one. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we, um, take it, we, we, we extra mom, we adjust mom, we send mom over to uh, get an MRI. Mom consults with the neurosurgeon. And the orthopedic surgeon, he goes, this is our vitamin. Your disc exploded. It is wrapped around the nerve of your lower back. 
you can try doing some therapy, but you're going to need surgery, and don't get adjusted. Now, what if my mom didn't know a good chiropractor? <laughs> we can joke about it, but she ends up on the surgical table. Yeah. So we work with mom, because I know I'm never going to hurt my mom, and nothing I can do could ever hurt my mom. And so we start taking care of mom, and uh, she was having to walk on a cane. In fact, on Thanksgiving, her leg gave out several times, and she fell. That's how bad her nerve, her, the nerve was shutting down. And we started taking care of mom, and she started doing some therapeutic exercise. And here we are, five or six months later. No cane, full power of legs, no shots, no surgery. And that doctor that told her she was going to need surgery ended up retiring over that period of time. And it's probably a good thing. Okay? No, I don't mean that. I wish he wasn't retired so that he could have seen her progress and then helped many other people get far along. So, if there's somebody that I can help, give the gift of help, it's my mom right there in the red hair. <laughs> medical doctors you're noticing. We get referrals from medical doctors. In fact, one of the most prominent medical doctors in the world is now working with upper cervical colleagues of mine. Dr. Damanian invented the MRI unit. If you invent the MRI unit, you're like the Thomas Edison of medicine. He invented a new MRI unit that you haven't heard about yet, because there's only about four in the world. It's video MRI. So instead of a snapshot, you can actually see the cerebral spinal fluid flowing in and out of the brain. And what he found, working with MS, Parkinson's, ALS patients, and NFL football players who've had CTE, when there's a misalignment in the upper neck, it backs the cerebral spinal fluid up into the brain, and the proteins in the fluid start eating away at the brain. And he came out at a conference of neurologists in New York City, and he said the underlying cause of MS, Parkinson's, ALS, neurodegenerative diseases, is an upper cervical misalignment that goes uncorrected. And, between, and what happened in the study was the first symptom and the trauma, there was 11 years between them. So nobody was making the connection, the patient nor the neurologist. It's so the first question I asked. Tell me about your past traumas, accidents, or injuries, even if you feel it's unrelated. And so I'm watching the Super Bowl, I flip over to ESPN, and there's Jim McMahon, the old 1985 quarterback of the Bears. And a lot of those players have committed suicide, have early onset dementia, are having all, you've seen the Will Smith movie, Concussion. Yeah. The cause of CTE, the damage to the brain, is this fluid backing up. So Jim McMahon on ESPN 33, Google it, is talking about getting the upper cervical adjustment, and they show his brain before and after. And he describes it as if someone flushed the toilet. And he went from having suicidal thoughts where he couldn't remember his kids' names to being able to manage, but the damage is done, the damage is done. And so the next patient is going to share his story. And a lot of people can relate to back and neck pain, and a lot of people can relate to having severe neurological changes in their body. And the adjustment that we do is not a neck and back adjustment, it's a brain adjustment. And Michael's going to share his story right now. Come on. Good evening. My name is Michael, and I'm an alcoholic. No, I'm just kidding. Wrong meeting. Sorry. Wrong meeting. No, I'm not. I don't even drink, but when you hear my story, you're going to think that I should have at least. Well, I own and operate a landscape business for 38 years. I'm 56 years old. You get up in the morning, you get pain, ah, you shake it off. Advil is the strongest drug I've ever done in my life. You take it, you go to work. You've got four kids, you've got a wife, you got to take care of things. You, you suck it up. Started six months ago, worked like a dog, came home, a little tired, had the kids dinner, we had a great time, went to bed, woke up the next day, and literally couldn't walk. Don't know what was wrong. Walking like this, like I was on a trampoline, dizzy, spinning, make my way to the kitchen, look at my wife, said, something's wrong, something's not right. But again, you go to work, okay, maybe I slept wrong, whatever. Without boring you with all the details, but 11 doctors later, including my own regular doctor that I've seen for years who gave me meclizine and said, you got vertigo, you're a tough guy, go home, suck it up, take, the, take this, you got vertigo, I got vertigo, 80 year old patients have vertigo. So what did I do? I listened to my doctor. Meclizine, nothing getting better, it kept working. Getting a little worse. Ears would ring, scale of one to 10, 
always a five. Three was a good day. And when they ran, when it was a ten, it was a siren in my head. A siren where I wanted to jump off the balcony. Now it continues on, getting worse, getting more dizzy. My wife now is panicking, we're Googling stuff. Felt faint. Better go to the hospital, right? You gotta do what you gotta do. So we go to the hospital, can't do an MRI, there's no neurologist on call. Doctor comes in and says, and my wife, as her witness, looks at me and says, there are so many forms of brain cancer. We can't look for them all right now, diagnose them. So whatever you have is not gonna kill you today. So my suggestion is get a neurologist, get an MRI, and you know, see where you're at, and let them tell you the best form of treatment. Prior to that, I went to an ENT because my cardiologist said, sounds like an inner ear issue. So my ENT, after doing tons of tests, says to me, and my wife, the ringing in the ears, I'm nauseous, I'm losing weight, I'm dizzy. Sounds like a brain tumor. Don't want to scare you. Now, brain tumor, brain cancer, two doctors, where we grew up trusting doctors, right? You, your kids, you go to the doctor, your mother's worked by the doctor. Okay, great, wow. Now we're through the holidays. It's Christmas, it's New Year's. The doctor goes away on vacation, never orders the MRI for My wife calls, finds me another antique in that same practice, literally cries on the phone. I'm not the guy that ever laid down, I couldn't get out of bed. I'm, I suck it up, I go to work sick, whatever it takes. Finally, I get the MRI, all comes back great. The Ron says and ruled out all the bad stuff, you don't have brain cancer, you don't have a brain tumor. Great, what is it? Sounds like a vestibular migraine. But well, what is that? That's eh, a lot of things in the, never, not once. I've described to everybody my symptoms. I walk and I feel like I'm gonna fall over. I walk up a flight of stairs, I gotta hold the rail. The ringing in my ears are screaming. These are the same symptoms I told 11 doctors. 11 doctors, which by the way, never cured me of anything. Just wanted to give me drugs on top of drugs, which I never took. And my health insurance paid for every one of the guys that didn't do anything for me. The guy that, did something for me, really did something for me, because five months ago I couldn't stand it here without leaning on something. They're not paying for it. So that whole thing that he was talking about, I was totally on board with that. It's horrible. But anyway, so I went in there, sat down. In two days, well, I should back it up. My wife, my angel, stood by me the whole time. <laughs> when I really thought I was planning my funeral, <laughs> right or wrong, right? So anyway, but I get crazy because it was rough. It was rough. Couldn't work. Couldn't